everyone. Welcome to the class. I'm hoping that you're going to enjoy this semester. My name is Dr. William Kearns. I want to give you a quick little introduction to the course as well as to philosophy of education and philosophy in general in this brief discussion. About myself, since you're just now getting to know me, I'm a former English teacher and a reading teacher in Central Florida high schools while I was in Central Florida. I used to also be a reading specialist and a curriculum specialist. My primary teaching areas were English language arts at the high school level and reading at the high school level. After uh, teaching high school, I went on to be a doctoral student at Clemson University. I was a full-time doctoral student uh, there for several years. I studied English language arts education as a focus area at Clemson University. I wound up with a PhD in curriculum and instruction there. After that, for four years, I was an assistant professor of English education at Harris Stowe State University. I was program coordinator for middle and secondary education at Harris Stowe State University. That's an HBCU in Midtown St. Louis. HBCU stands for Historically Black College and University. Um, I'm here at University of Arkansas, Little Rock. Happy to be here. Okay, so first of all, about philosophical inquiry. Well, philosophical, um, to be a philosopher means, of course, you're a lover of knowledge. That is juxtaposed from philosoph, which means someone who uh, pursues knowledge, loves knowledge, but isn't someone who does something. So philosophical means you're a lover of knowledge. Inquiry means you're in pursuit of knowledge. You're using methods of inquiry to pursue knowledge. There are several sub areas of philosophical inquiry that affect the field. One is, of course, metaphysics. Now, I know that you guys are probably used to the term metaphysics having to do with something that's metaphysical, as in spiritual or maybe new agey, that sort of thing. That was not the historical use of the term as it was used back in the 1700s, 1800s when philosophy was evolving. Metaphysics means the study of questions about the nature of reality. When the natural sciences were emerging, physics and geography and geology and so on and so forth, they were considered sub-branches of metaphysics in their origination. Because again, what are you doing when you're studying the natural sciences? You're studying the nature of reality. So again, a branch of philosophy is nature of reality. Now, depending on what conclusions you draw about the nature of reality, is reality constructed? Is there a hardcore real reality? Um, that's going to lead you in different directions. The assumptions you draw, the conclusions you make about the nature of reality shape how you in turn are going to want to do the curriculum. Then we get to epistemology. That's the nature of knowledge. Um, and a sub-branch of epistemology, of course, is the theory of truth. So what is knowledge? How is knowledge shaped? How do we get our knowledge? What's the nature of truth? Is truth absolute or is truth something that we form as part of a group, part of a consensus? Again, the conclusions that we reach very much shape how we pursue education and what type of education we form as part of our curriculum. Then we get into axiology. That's the nature of values. Um, Sub-branch of that would be, of course, ethics. Axiology strongly shapes um, the decisions we make about right versus wrong, good versus bad, harm versus not doing harm. And that, in turn, of course, shapes curriculum. So again, as you look at curriculum theory, always in each of these branches that we study, always think about what's the nature of reality that's underlying, um, what's the nature of knowledge, and what values. So again, reality, knowledge, and values. That is underlying everything that we look at. You can see a little bit more with axiology, with values, you look at what is good, what is ethical. You're always asking those questions. With metaphysics, what is real? How can I know that something is real or not? Um, are the things that are real limited to what can be measured? That gets into, within research paradigms, positivism. Or are there things that are real that 
are outside of our ability to measure them. When we get into epistemology, how do we know what is truth? Uh, that gets into various theories of truth. Some people believe that there are absolute truths. Some people believe that truth is a matter of consensus in a joint community of inquiry. Okay, further about philosophy of education. In this discussion, we're going to talk about idealism as well as realism. Uh, going back to the ancient Greeks, those were two contrasting branches of education. Idealism, you're looking at Socrates and Plato. The Socratic method of dialogue is highlighted here in idealism. Uh, you're looking at generic notions of truth. The philosophers often pose abstract questions that are not easily answered, but are concerned with the search for truth. Socrates, of course, was known for doing this in the dialogues of Plato. And in fact, Socrates went around asking such questions of the citizens that eventually, of course, Socrates had to drink hemlock. Uh, so again, moral to the story is that if you make a pest out of yourself, um, making people stop taking things for granted and realize, okay, we might be a little bit ignorant about things that we're taking for granted, people are going to get mad at you. That's one of the risks that we take as philosophers and as researchers and as scholars. The world of matter is in constant state of flux according to idealism. The senses are not to be trusted. They can continuously deceive us. That is an early predecessor to the assumptions that we make under constructivism um, and pragmatism when we learn more about pragmatism. Idealism is strongly related to constructivism and pragmatism as a predecessor. Truth is perfect and eternal, but it is not to be found in the world of matter, only through the mind. Again, that's the assumption of a constructed truth. Um, so again, um, when we look at constructivism, uh, as known by Vygotsky and Piaget, and also Dewey was a constructivist, when we look at the pragmatists, that's the assumption that what we know about reality is a mental construct. When we look at social constructivists later, as they would eventually evolve, similar to idealism, you're looking at the construct of truth put together with influences by society. So there we get into social construct of truth. More about idealism. The only constant for Plato was mathematics. They were thought of to be unchanging and eternal. Plato's method of dialogue, as evidenced through Socrates, the Socratic method of dialogue and inquiry, um, you're looking at systematic, logical explanation of all points of view. So Socrates, if you read um, the Socratic method, if you read uh, Plato's dialogues, you'll see that he um, urged the people that he was in dialogue with systematically to consider, consider all possible points. Eventually, of course, the conclusion was, I don't know the things that I thought I knew. Ultimately, it leads to agreement or synthesis of ideas, or at least the admission to ignorance. Um, again, the statement that uh, is often repeated is that uh, the admission of ignorance is actually the beginning of knowledge. And I want to go back here just a little bit. You notice the word dialectic on the screen here. We'll come back to the word dialectic later in this course when we look at Hegel, when we look at Marx, when we look at critical theory. Um, the notion, and Dewey drew on, drew on the notion of dialectic too with pragmatism. The notion of a dialectic, this uh, examine of all points of view, uh, uh, this into a synthesis of something new, that is something that other philosophers draw upon deeply as we get further into philosophy. So pay attention to, to this word dialectic. Plato believed that education helps move individuals collectively toward achieving a common good. So again, he believed in the value of education. He believed in the worth of education. And he believed that education is something that is extremely important for society to become a good society. 
the state should be involved in education. So you get into early notions of public schools, although they were very different than what we're looking at these days, of course, because Plato is not someone who believed in this um, democratic notions that we have today. Uh, the broader students would be more moved toward study of more sophisticated, nuanced, abstract ideas as they collect and examine data. Those who are broader should rule others and should assume um, greater responsibility. So again, it's this notion that the best and brightest in society, the most well-educated in society become the rulers. This is leading toward the notion of a philosopher king that would lead the state ultimately toward a good society. So a philosopher's a king is someone who pursues inquiry, pursues knowledge, pursues truth um, through questioning methods, this Socratic method of inquiry, and eventually uh, takes leadership. And again, this was this notion that kings were something good notice this is he's not describing a democracy but it's also this notion that kings rule benevolently we get into the notion of good versus evil with idealism evil comes through ignorance education leads toward the obliteration of evil so again it's this notion that Education is worthwhile. Education leads toward good. Educa uh, and it's this notion that we can better ourselves, this notion of ongoing growth. Other idealists would be St. Augustine, Descartes, Kant, Hegel. Um, Hegel, of course, strongly drew on the notion of dialectic approaches. In fact, all of these philosophers had a type of dialectic approach, the synthesis, um, examination of all ideas, and eventually coming to a synthesis of a conclusion and a new idea based, on, based upon that. Of course, these idealists would uh, draw upon their own influences and they would differ from Plato in distinctly different ways. Obviously, Plato was not a Christian. St. Augustine was. And so the idealism of St. Augustine would look very different than Plato's say, um, idealism. Same with Descartes um, would not look exactly like St. Augustine, but there were enough similarities that I would call them idealists. Notice Kant, Immanuel Kant. Um, Kant, you'll see later in this course, was deeply influential on constructivism as well as pragmatism and even critical theory. Um, now, an irony uh, with Immanuel Kant is that by modern notions, Immanuel Kant would be considered a racist. He had uh, very deeply disturbing views on race uh, and on what we might call racial identities um, in his day by modern standards, he would very much be considered a racist. But at the same time, despite that, he is very deeply influential on critical theory and notions of justice. So we get into the goal of education. Education is interested in the search for truth through ideas. With truth comes responsibility. My, at the risk of sounding humorous, you get into the Spider-Man uh, thing that, of course, truth means power. Truth means responsibility. With great power comes responsibility. Education is intended to be transformational. Ideas can change lives. This is very much of an idealist notion. More about idealism. The role of the teacher under idealism, uh, we're talking about St. Augustine, Kant, uh, Plato, and of course, idealism would, under St. Augustine, very much influence schools, um, certain types of Catholic schools. The role of the teacher is to analyze and discuss ideas with students, so it's very much teacher-centered. St uh, students can move toward new levels of awareness under the guidance of the teacher through inquiry, through Socratic dialogue. The students can ultimately be transformed. So again, you don't leave through education the same way that you begin. Education is deeply transformational. Methods of instruction. Sometimes you might lecture. Uh, oftentimes you would use the Socratic method of inquiry. In fact, when we get into idealist method, methods of instruction, you would see 
students oftentimes sitting around in a circle. Um, you would see the teacher sometimes lecturing them, sometimes engaged in dialogue, um, inquiry, question followed by question followed by question with this with a student responding and the teacher prompting the student to think more deeply the way that Socrates might do that and that is intended to spur analysis synthesis often on the spot as the as the student applies ideas into hypothetical scenarios and all of this inquiry is supposed to lead toward uh, contemporary society and a greater common good, a more just society. The curriculum is important in terms of study of the classics. So again, we don't throw away the old, we're constantly building on the old. Modern uh, approaches to the curriculum that draw on idealism, including we'll look at perennialism later in this course. There is a strong emphasis on Greek philosophy, on Latino, on Latin philosophy, on Roman philosophy, the ideas of Rome and Greece, uh, the, I, um, so scratch the other word that I use right there about Latino, that implies something else that gets into critical theory. Um, sorry about that. But, and we also get into, of course, the valuing of the Renaissance. In modern times, the way that idealism tends to be shaped, it tends to be a little bit Western centric. That sometimes is a flaw of it that has led to some debates. So again, as we think about idealism and you read about real about perennialism with Theodore Sizer and others, I want you to think about the influence of idealism a great deal in uh, perennialism. Now we get into realism. Realism is also a strong influence on uh, perennialism, but it also in many ways when we later look at social efficiency as an ideology. Realism also strongly shapes social efficiency. There is a method of inquiry called positivism. Positivism means that you rely on just the evidence that you can measure. Anything else, this world of ideas is not as valuable as what you can measure. So again, we look at statistics, data, hard data that are valued by positivists. That's very much a realist notion. And we're looking at Aristotle uh, as our key uh, from ancient Greece influencer on the field of realism. Aristotle was a leading proponent. He started the Lyceum, which uh, and he was which was kind of a school of philosophy with students. Uh, some of the great uh, philosophers of ancient Greece were influenced by. Um, by Aristotle. He was the first philosopher to develop a systematic theory of logic. So when we look at the, at the field of logic, we owe a great deal of debt to Aristotle. Aristotle was a scientist, um, a very real scientist. He conducted scientific experiments. He studied nature. And in fact, Dewey uh, was not uh, the first, um, not Dewey, I'm sorry, I'm tired, but um, yeah, Dewey was not the first person to draw on this, but also what I meant to say, I'm sorry, Darwin was not the first uh, person to come up with a type of theory of evolution. Aristotle came up with a theory of evolution long, long, long before the life of Darwin. Now he got some things wrong, quite a few things wrong if you look into it. He got a few things borderline right, actually. He had some legitimate points, but he was also influenced by Greek mythos, by beliefs, uh, by assumptions that he was making to draw some of the wrong conclusions too. So it's not like his theory of evolution was exactly right, Like, uh, but at the same time, the fact that he did come up with a type of theory of evolution shows you uh, that he very much believed in evidence in facts, in gathering data through an early form of what we might call the scientific method. 
He believed that only through studying the material world is it possible to clarify and develop ideas. Matter is real, independent of ideas. That gets you into the importance of matter, the importance of hard data, the importance of things that you can see, feel, taste, touch as primarily important, independent of ideas. This sounds like some people you may have run into. It's not so much what do you think, it's more what do you know based upon the facts, based upon the evidence, based upon the hard data. Some philosophers' questions in the realist approach, what is the good life? What is the importance of reason? And of course, Aristotle was an advocate of moderation in all things, balance in the leading of one's life. Reason was thought of as the instrument to help people achieve balance and moderation. So this was a very thoughtful, very contemplative uh, life of inquiry and what we might call science. More about the realists. Uh, the realists influence a great deal of philosophy. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about religion here because of course religion was very deeply influential on the field of philosophy and natural philosophy including science as we look at the Renaissance. Realists influenced what would, what we might call Neo-Thomism, uh, drawing on Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas um, developed a synthesis of pagan ideas as well as Christian beliefs in his study of religion. Um, Aquinas promoted the idea that reason is the means of ascertaining or, or understanding the truth. Um, reason as opposed to, let's say, meditation, prayer, etc. And that God can be understood through reasoning based upon the material world. Aquinas promoted the idea that there is no conflict between science and religion. Of course, many people do see a conflict there. The world of faith with the world of reason are interlinked um, under the notion of Thomas Aquinas. So now we get into modern realism. It's from realism that we get the ideas of people like Francis Bacon, um, who is primarily known for developing induction as well as the modern form of the scientific method. Um, and Bacon was, of course, drawing on Aristotle to develop that method of observation, generalization, testing of hypothesis, a verification of findings, verification of conclusions, and all that leading to new inquiry. And of course, John Locke was very much a realist. Uh, so it's the idea that we are born a blank slate, tabula rasa, and what we know, we only know through experience. Locke was a proponent of an ordered sense of data and reflecting based upon that data, based upon that experience to grow and to become educated. Some contemporary realists. Uh, there's Alfred North Whitehead, who was a famous mathematician as well as physicist in the early 20th century. He believed in universal patterns um, in philosophy, universal patterns of truth, universal patterns of reality. And he be did believe that there is a real reality um, as opposed to something that's constructed or something that we don't even really uh, know whether it can exist or not. He was very much a, a realist in terms of reality is real. Uh, that can be constructed through patterns. Bertrand Russell, um, who is of course famous for, for Principia Mathematica. Uh, Russell also believed that there are universal patterns in nature that can be verified and classified through mathematics. Goal of realists, and this will be my last slide, but then I'll continue on just a little bit more, include notions of the good life, truth. Beauty can be answered through the study of ideas as well as, here we come again, dialectical method. This, um, you look at all possible ideas, you look at the evidence, you synthesize the evidence into a new conclusion, a new way of understanding. For contemporary realists, the goal of education is to help individuals understand and apply principles of science. Uh, they're very much data-oriented, very much 
evidence-oriented to help solve problems plaguing the modern world. Now, a little bit about some of the um, philosophies that we'll study in this course. We'll look at perennialism, as well as social efficiency, as well as pragmatism, as well as critical theory, uh, sometimes also called reconstructionism. The first one that we'll look at in this course will be perennialism. Perennialism draws deeply upon uh, the philosophies of the Greeks, the Romans, like I said earlier, you basically believe that you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You draw on classical ideas, classical beliefs, and you want to help uh, students in your classes to get to know these ideas. Uh, perennialism was very deeply influential in the late 1800s into the tw early 20th century, and it still is influential. You might see people who believe in the perennialist curriculum reciting uh, Greek, learning Greek, seeing value in learning Greek, learning and reciting Latin, learning the classics of literature. By classics, of course, I mean Western classics, Greek classics, the Latin classics, Shakespeare within the um, English uh, canon. And of course, uh, the traditional theories and ideas of mathematics and sciences would be strongly learned for realists uh, or, and for perennialists. They also believed in kind of a back to basics movement. Let's get back to the basics of what's the classical canon, what's the classical ideas of science. Let's learn those. And by learning those, we will join this kind of great society. Um, that has been building through human history. So that's perennialism in a nutshell. Then we get into social efficiency. Social efficiency, we'll look at later, deals with how can we in the most efficient manner possible um, help our students become productive members of society so that they will take on their professions, they will gain the skills they need. There is a strong emphasis on assessing the intelligence and the aptitude of students, assessing what skills will be needed for the jobs of the future, and using that assessment to usher students into the curriculum and into a track of the curriculum. Social efficiency is behind the movement toward what we might say the high stakes standards movement, the high stakes testing movement as well. And it's behind things like IQ testing that has been used often for tracking students, especially in the 1920s and 1930s, IQ testing was, was known for that. Even today, if you take the SAT or the ACT uh, as a type of measure of aptitude to predict your aptitude, now granted these tests are problematic for a variety of reasons, including cultural biases embedded within these tests, but the idea of the SAT and the ACT as having predictive uh, and powerful value is a social efficiency idea. It goes along with tracking and it goes with along with trying to make education efficient. This factory model of education, that social efficiency in a nutshell. Then we get into pragmatism. Pragmatism is sometimes also called child-centered or learner-centered philosophy. With pragmatism, you're talking about John Dewey, uh, you're talking about inquiry, you're talking about construction of ideas, you're talking about value of reflective thought, value of reflective thought for its own sake, and you're talking about learning is a consensus. When we talk about theory of truth, truth is a consensus uh, that we reach as a group under pragmatism. And finally, we'll look at um, critical theory. A critical theory, sometimes also called reconstructionism, deals with we want to name what's wrong in society, we want to name the problems, name the injustices, the inequities, who has a voice versus who does not have a voice, who is empowered versus who is not empowered, who is oppressed versus who benefits from the oppression, who is the oppressor name that in order to make changes in society. Um, it's very much of a change-based uh, thing. 
Now, we cannot evade uh, politics. This will not be an apolitical course. Uh, so what your own political views are in this course, I'm absolutely fine with that regardless. Uh, generally speaking, people who are perennialists in their outlook on curriculum tend to be conservative. People who are who believe in social efficiency, again, they tend to be conservative. But again, there are differences in here and there are variances. People who uh, believe in the approach of pragmatism tend to be liberal. And people who believe in the approach of social constructivism, um, the people who believe in the approach of critical theory and reconstructionism, they have a tendency to be liberal. Again, that's with variation. I can't make those sweeping statements about every single person, but that's a tendency there. And of course, most teachers, most philosophers will kind of combine different theories into kind of a patchwork. It's rare that I meet a teacher who will say I'm pure, all one, and not a combination of some. Uh, Dewey, for instance, was all of the above, um, but he was most especially a pragmatist. Although if you study the work of Dewey, you will find some perennialism in him. You'll find some social efficiency in him with his value of testing. Uh, and you'll also find uh, a definitely a great deal of critical theory uh, within Dewey. In fact, and during the Depression era of the 1930s, he especially became a Reconstructionist, a critical theorist during the 1930s. There are other philosophies of education, other ideal, other um, ideologies that we're not going to have time to look at in great detail in this course. It's a relatively short course. For instance, postmodernism, we're gonna not going to have a hard, and we're not going to have much time to look at it during this course. That looks at structures, that looks at assumptions, eventually breaks them down, um, in and breaks down our, our assumptions a great deal. Oftentimes you have these questioning of truth and reality to the point where we really don't know that much under a postmodern and pro-structuralist approach to the curriculum. And it's postmodernism tends to be very inquiry based again. It's constant, constant state of growth, constant questioning. Because again, we cannot settle on one final answer because there is no one final answer under a postmodern curriculum. Um, Dahl and Pinar are known for that. Uh, we're also, you're also going to see some articles that mention humanism. With humanism, think of Maslow, uh, this self-actualization uh, that uh, all of you guys have known uh, from Maslow that I'm sure you've heard before. Um, and with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, people who are humanists believe in valuing the worth the dignity of the human being and helping each student reach their full human potential to the point of what Maslow would call self-actualization. That's humanism in a nutshell. I'm not going to study humanism for one thing, because honestly speaking, and the field of curriculum theory is open to all kinds of debates, but in my personal view, um, humanism has become infused throughout other ideologies as well. And so it's difficult to find someone who is a pure humanist, uh, but you can find people who are, for instance, perennialists as well as humanists. And you will certainly find people who are social efficiency advocates as well as humanists. So again, that's one reason why you'll hear me mentioning Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy of needs and self-actualization. I'll make references to humanism. But as you've seen with the syllabus, we're not going to be reading articles that are 100% uh, devoted to humanism. Okay, that's the little introduction. Feel free to uh, get in touch with me anytime. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully it was helpful. And let me know if you have any questions whatsoever as you tackle your early readings in this course. Thank you very much.